Extend a warm Weller family welcome to the very first Business Network Live digital special. And let me introduce you to your host for today, Hazel Haraki. Hello, guys. Thank you so much for joining. As Lynn said, or the voice of God, my name is Hazel Haraki. I am head of salon groups at Weller Professionals UK and Ireland. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our first hour digital special that we're doing for you. Um, for those of you not in the know, every July we do a business network live at the Belfry Hotel and we get a few hundred hairdressers in a room with experts from inside and outside our industry and we motivate you and we give you new perspectives and that's exactly what we want to do today because as COVID does, it uh, cancelled our event this year like it has most um, events and we want to just bring you some motivation today to motivate the motivators and talk about the things that are on your mind. Um, we had 60 plus questions actually submitted before we started today, so we've got a lot of content to get through. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panellists that we've got today um, and I've promised to them that I will be more Kate Garraway than mm -hmm. Morgan so they can all relax um, and I'd like to start by introducing our first of four panelists today which is Raymond Batone. Um, Raymond is um, a salon owner of 11 years, he started in, in the industry at 22 um, and he's running a highly successful salon in Brentwood, Essex. Um, he's also very proud to be one of the consultants at a consultancy called My Salon Manager um, and they work with over 100 salons across the UK, helping them to navigate their way through owning any sort of business at the moment, especially one within the hair and beauty industry. There he is. Hi Raymond. Hello Hazel, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. Sorry, I, I've actually been in the industry since I was, well, 15. Um, I've owned a salon since I was 22, so... Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been phenomenal. Love it. You don't look old enough, Raymond. I do. I'm wrinkly. It's, I've got filters all over the place. Just take the compliment. Take the compliment. <laughs> um, secondly, I'd love to introduce from over in Ireland, you probably have seen her before. It's Sarah Mason of Sarah Mason Professional in Galway. Um, so Sarah's been in the industry. Let's hope I've got this one right, Sarah. You can tell me off like Raymond if you want to, but I think it's 25 years. Um, yeah. She was one of the leading forces on our Weller Hair UK and Ireland Instagram page. Um, she did a whole series of um, topics for us on Instagram Live. I think you might hold the record, Sarah, for having the most <laughs> Instagram Live. And if anybody missed them, they can see you on our uh, Instagram page on Instagram Live. No, IGTV. They're all saved yeah. on, on there. Um, and we're really pleased to have you for an Irish perspective today. So welcome. Thank you. Um, thirdly, I'd love to introduce um, Natasha Grossman. So Natasha represents the 24 Salon Strong Group 
Hob, um, who are in London, and at the moment are Fellowship for British Hairdressing Salon Group of the Year. Tash, which you're very proud of, I know, we're very proud of you as well. Um, Tash really worked her way up from grassroots level. She's kind of done every single role you could imagine at Hobbs Salons. Um, she worked her way up to regional business manager, and now she is very proud and very passionate to be called the general manager for Hobbs Salons. So welcome, Tash. Thank you so much. It's lovely to finally be on and here with everyone. Good, we had a few technical issues, but we made it in the end. Um, and then finally, I'm really excited that we've got a different perspective actually from Germany. So we've got Lars Nikolassen, who's joining us from Hamburg. Um, Lars has got three salons there. He's a long time member of our artistic pool that we use over in Ger Weller, Germany. Um, and he does his own podcast and he's done a lot of topics recently around restarting your business, which obviously is very relevant for us. And they actually opened in Germany two months before us. They um, reopened their salons in May. So I'm hoping Lars is gonna bring us a little bit of a Mystic Meg vibe and tell us <laughs> hopefully all the positive things that are to come. And we're feeling a little bit anxious at the moment. Of course we are, but I'm hoping that Lars will uh, show us in two months time, hopefully, where we're also <laughs> big. So you're in a little bit of a better position than us at the moment, Lars, hiya. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks uh, that I'm invited and um, I'm looking forward to the next hour. Good. And I promise to talk slowly. Lars did tell me off the other day, we had a little rehearsal. I talk a little bit too fast, so I will try and slow it down. <laughs> Please. So, thank you. You're welcome. So without further ado, I'd love to get into the questions, guys, because we have only got about 50 minutes now. We're going to finish at 2.30. Um, and like I said, we had so many questions come in from everybody that's joined today. And what I wanted to start with is going to you, Sarah, because I know in Ireland you're now at level three. Things look great for a bit, and now you've gone a little back, a little bit backwards with the COVID levels rising. Just where's your head at as a business owner? How are the team feeling now with what's going on? Well, you know, my thing is always power of positivity. Um, I'm not going to let this beat me. You know, we need to be forceful in our thinking. And um, at the moment, actually, I'm making a lot of plans because I do think a closure is on the way. And I think I'm, I'm kind of planning for the worst, let's say. I think the first time like we when we went into closure, you know, we, we didn't see it coming as fast as we did. Where I think now salons have had time to think about things. Certainly my way of thinking is a little bit different. Um, I've been making a lot of plans in the background and um, how we are going to work when we are closed and managing the client base. And I think that's the biggest kind of, um, you know, it's, it's the hardship of business is, you know, what do you do with all those people when you face the closure? And the one bit of advice I'll give to anyone, guys, is that I did actually create a clinic at home where we had redirected the phone line and I was able to speak. Now, I know for others where they've met, you know, multiple salon groups, it's a little bit more difficult, but I held on to every single client I possibly could. So we made ourselves a little bit kind of, you know, it wasn't like we were untouchable. And I think that was a, that's a massive thing that the, the public were able to kind of get in touch and we were able to give them good advice about maybe not taking the task of pulling their own hair or giving them some product advice, being able to sell products, you know, sending out retail and stuff. So, you know, if we're going to be facing into that, which is very possible, I think our, our government is holding all the strings tight to try and stop the closure. But it's hard to know. I think we'll know the end of this week in Ireland where we stand. I do think that there is a good, strong stand here in business in the industry. It's the one thing I'd say. Um, I think the cities are struggling a little bit. But, you know, we just, it, it's like everything. We've all had to change. I mean, we are at half capacity, but the figures are really good. So it's about remodeling your business at this time. Um, and when you have time, I actually was very grateful for the time. So, you know, we're just... We'll just weigh it in and see what happens. And hopefully in a week's time, we'll have a little bit, you know, we'll know where we're going and then we can make a plan. But plan for the worst, expect the best, kind of, yeah? It is. Like, yeah, I just think that sometimes, you know, I actually, it's a really strange way to think to see it, but I actually was very grateful. My business is four years old. And if I actually had the time I had during COVID before I went into my business, I actually would have gone into my business very differently. And I think now after having, we had like what, 17 weeks off or 16 weeks off, I had time to kind of write some structure, you know, structure for my team. I had time to write some education for my team. 
and I had time to kind of plan where I wanted uh, my future business to be. And I think my mind has really changed. And um, my work life has absolutely changed. I've actually cut back my days. Um, and I suppose I'm managing my business an awful lot better, but I am captivating the client base that I want in the days that I'm actually on the salon floor and charging more for it. So there is, if you're clever about it, you know, even like my, we're a small team and I know the agreements are the same, you know, we're a small team. So when you have a small team and a small aesthetic in your business, um, you really have to think hard in your heels about how you're going to bring in the same take and you're only using maybe five chairs. So, you know what? It's actually been a huge success for us. I'm really happy with the business uh, end of things. And we are making plans for next year. We're making big plans for next year. And I'm very much about, you know, let's, you know, in, in the industry, let's fight for who we are as salon owners. I think that's an, another topic you know, that we really need to kind of be mindful of that, especially in Ireland, you know, hairdressing underground is a very serious topic. So I need, we need to nurture though that client base that's coming through the door. Um, every single client now is gold dust. You have to treat them with the, that, like they're the only person in your life when they come through the door. It is a little bit more demanding, but it's been super. But like you just said, and this is what I've heard from a lot of people, in less clients, but you're charging a bit more. So we're taking a little bit more from those clients. And I guess, Lars, to come to you a little bit, you know, in these times, it is about working smarter rather than, than harder. You know, life is difficult at the moment anyway, but every client you get in, how can you make sure that you're working smart and not hard? Um, what have you done within your salon group to make sure that, that you're doing that? Um. <clears throat> Good question. I would like to answer in German. That would be much more easier for me. So I try to, to, <laughs> to, to find my right, correct English words. I think um, today the key of success is not to think about the problems that you have and not to think about what kind of money do you need. First of all, think about how your employees feel. Think about how your customers feel and make it as good as possible for them. Because when they trust you and when they trust uh, uh, the, um, uh, the salon owner and they, they, they trust the team, then everything is much easier for the future. So um, not working harder, working smarter, that means for me, be in touch with your employees, uh, uh, have a good communication with them, treat them well, be honest with them, uh, and then try to, to find answers to all the questions that we have together in a, uh, as a team. So really trying to think of it from those two perspectives. And I, I know you just mentioned about thinking about it from your client's perspective. Tasha, if I can come to you just quickly, because we are hearing this as well quite a bit, and this is one of the questions that came through. So how can we put ourselves in the mind of young clients? Because when I speak to quite a few salon owners at the moment, they're saying, it's not actually the older clients that are our issue. They're coming back. It's the younger clients. Where have they gone? What are they doing with their hair? You know, how can we get younger clients back into the salon? What are they thinking? You know, because a lot of um, the questions that came in said that they think it's driven by loss of jobs with younger people and confidence in their area. So, yeah, younger clients, like what, what can we do to get them back in? So I totally agree with what you've just said, actually, in terms of the older clientele. And I'd say for the past sort of three to four years maybe, as a brand, we have been going for 38 years and our clientele, the average sort of age of the clients that come into the majority of our salons started from kind of mid to late forties upwards. And we've been working really hard over the last few years to actually attract that younger clientele. Because for us, it's about having a client for life. We want them to start their journey at Harbour's children and then they grow to teenagers and then they grow up with us. And we do have that in a lot of the salons, but I think the key thing into targeting a younger audience is very much investing into social media with the young millennials and the Generation X. You know, that is what they eat, sleep and breathe. It's that phone in their 
and they're on it the whole time. I've got an eight year old daughter. She knows how to navigate an iPad better than I do. And we yeah. really realized in lockdown how people had to adjust, even if you weren't someone that was particularly confident on online shopping or doing all of those things, or you weren't particularly tech savvy, lockdown almost made people have no choice but to get to grips with doing your food shopping online, hosting meetings, teaching classes, all of those things. So I would say that firstly, social media is, is huge and we're really, really investing heavily into that now. We launch, well, we're about to launch, we work, we're working on our app that we've been working on for a number of years. But I think, again, silver lining from lockdown was that it really accelerated us to, to get that finalised and finished. And we're literally about to launch our app in a number of weeks, which we're super excited about. I think the other thing for young people, and I, they're, they're quite fickle, you know, they want kind of the latest thing, whether it's, you know, makeup, lipstick, whatever it might be, the latest restaurant. And I think for us, what we're going to be working on is low commitment services. So if people aren't going to be coming in as frequently because they don't want the commitment of having to spend money or they don't want something that enables them to have to come back as frequently, I'm sure the panel and hopefully the rest of the people listening um, have hopefully seen that we're really going to be focusing on things like the new colour masks, because again, it's a fantastic opportunity for that younger clientele to change their image, yeah. low cost, low commitment, and we're really going to be promoting it that way. Um, we also launched something over, well, it wasn't over lockdown, it was when we reopened, when Eat Out to Help Out ended, um, we launched something called Blow Out to Go Out. And it was basically an opportunity for people to come in for 20 pounds to have their hair blow dried. And we allowed them to book that service at the beginning of the week, Monday to Wednesday, like you could in the restaurants. Um, again, we use social media in a massive way. We're doing sponsored posts, especially because of the new algorithm with social media. A lot of accounts are being missed at the moment. And the way in which you want to be spotted is by doing sponsored posts. It's also a great, great way if you want to measure the sort of things that you're putting out there, because we measure everything that we do. And we did a sponsored post on social media and we actually got the, the insights from that and increased our actual blow dry business in one week by an additional hundred extra blow dries just wow. from that one sponsored post. So yeah i'd say social media low commitment services low cost services to really enable that um younger person to still come in and visit your salons yeah because they do they like to change up their look and i'm glad you've mentioned color fresh masks because i just feel like it's something that wella are doing at the moment that is so relevant you know it's an on the day color you don't actually have to skin test with it it's fun and it gets that younger clientele in so it sounds like you guys have really got a plan to market that now and i know you're doing a little bit with um influencers as well because you mm. you really value value them and you know people do value influencers opinions these days so it's and color fresh masks is a great thing for influencers to talk influencers to talk about so you, you did mention them being a bit transient though and a little bit fickle so raymond one thing i want to talk to you about is you know if you are going to be trying to get those younger people back in they might not um, recognize the damage they can do when they don't turn up for an appointment and i remember when we we're in lockdown there were quite a few business owners that said you know what we're charging deposits now. Every appointment, especially in those first kind of two weeks, you know, was maxed out. And every appointment that was missed, that could be 50, 100, 150 pounds worth of revenue to that salon. What are you doing at the moment about like can cancellations and taking pos um, deposits? Like, are you guys doing that? Are you still doing it? Would you do it with a 20 year old client? Well, if they don't show up, I'll go to their house and collect the money. So, no, um, send the boys down there's a key word you use there and it was deposit the, the issue with the word deposit is that a deposit is refundable um and you're dealing with i mean look if someone's ill at the moment do you want them coming into your salon probably not so you have to be careful with the existing clientele particularly um on how you treat a, re a, a sort of booking fee deposit culture so I guess in terms of how do you, you've got all these new people coming into your business. You don't know them from Adam. How do you know they're going to show up? How do you know they're not just going to come for the consultation and skin test and you never see them again? Well, at my salon, we have um, a booking fee. And this is something that we've advocated to our members um, to do for quite some time before COVID-19, because people were already showing a lack of um, 
understanding of just how much value financially an appointment has for a salon, but also for motivation. Um, I think Lars was saying about the emotions of your team, nothing is worse than someone not showing up for a huge appointment, a huge balayage, and they don't show up. I mean, it's such a demotivator, but especially if they're target driven and especially if they're a performance driven stylist, there's nothing worse. So I say that you charge a deposit, um, a booking fee, and to keep things simple for your salon, you would charge a fixed amount rather than a percentage. I think when you start getting into percentages and the usual receptionist isn't there, particularly for smaller salons, they might not have a receptionist, just a, a fixed amount based on what the bill would you know, look like for your salon that's quite reasonable that would cover your costs if that client didn't show up. Now for my salon, we advocate 50 pound booking fee. We give them a slip at the desk and we just say, this is when you need to let us know that you, you know, when you need to come in basically, this is when the cutoff point in which you'll need to inform us. Um, but just keep the terms reasonable as well. So rather than just saying, well, if you don't show up or you don't give us, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna honor the, the, the value that you've paid us. You just hold it over for another appointment um, unless they've given you the notice that you've asked for and then you can refund them. Um, but every salon is completely different um, mm. and those amounts and the way it works should would be all different as a result. Um, but yeah, the booking fee, huge valuable tool. And I think our industry and many others, including the restaurant industry, are going to be heading towards that. Yeah. And it's just protecting you and your business, isn't it? And it's making them value that time that they've booked with you. And so many restaurants and things do it now as well. So, you know, it's not it's not alien to clients. And if they're serious about coming in, then they really shouldn't have a problem with it. Right. Have you ever had anybody who couldn't afford that 50 pounds? And then obviously it would be a one to one. Well, let's talk about what you can. Or is, are you very strict on 50 pounds or you're going to lose your booking? Uh, yeah, the stylist will advise at the consultation that to secure the appointment that they need to place a £50 booking fee. And that's that. And that's now, the booking fee also comes into effect if we have a client that repeatedly doesn't show and continues to disrespect our time. Mm -hmm. um, and we just communicate that you know, face to face from the stylist, the person they have the emotional connection with or the connection, particularly with yeah. existing clientele. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our clients have come to respect that, you know, and if they can't afford the 50 pounds, um, well, the, the, the bill on the other side of that is going to be far greater. This is just to cover our costs. It's not, you know, and to make sure it's almost like when you're buying a car, you know, they say you've got to pay this 500 pounds deposit, but the car's like 50 grand, but they just want to know you're serious about the purchase and to yeah. cover the loss of time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, totally get that. It's a great idea if you can make it work in your salon. Um, something that came in a lot <laughs> was around retail. So a lot about online retail, about what are you doing in your salon? What are the retail levels? You know, again, when I've been speaking to salon owners, it's a color seems to be relatively buoyant at the most uh, at, at the moment. And I know for some salons, even they're in growth with their color, you know, in pockets full of their sal of salons. Um, let's talk a little bit about retail because, you know, there is that e-com word and e-shops. Sarah, if I can come back to you, like, how do your team feel? Do you think they use it as a bit of an excuse? You know, well, customers will just go online, um, Sarah, and buy it cheaper. So there's no point in me even talking about it. You know, what, what do you do? What's your ethos around retail within Sarah Mason? So retail is very, very important to me, actually, and my team. And it's just not an option in my salon that they are not recommending retail. It just, it just doesn't happen. Um, and I suppose it, it, it comes back from when I trained myself. I think that... I always had a very strong st uh, stand in retail and I know that we're seeing it popping up in, in supermarkets or, you know, um, some of the bigger fashion houses now have, have um, their own retail ranges and stuff like that. But I think it kind of holds it back to that we are the specialists. And I kind of use the doctor analogy with my team that really if they can't recommend how to fix something, and send the client home with the product that they need, well, then they're not doing the job properly. So it really is, it's a, it's a part of their day um, and they really enjoy it. And I have to say, it's not really um, money orientated, you know, about their, about their sales. It's about the client service. And I suppose for me, it runs in, it, it, hand in hand with the consultation. So it should start from the beginning. You know, it shouldn't be at the end where, oh, I think you actually need these. I think it's very important that it's a process that starts from when the client comes in and that you start to talk about and to give them a little bit of, um, you know, 
a little bit of product knowledge that they kind of understand why you're why you're suggesting different products that you might have. So we actually stock all of the lines of well professionals. So we're very lucky, and I think that gives us a, a wide variance. And I just with the guys talking about you know money and stuff like that, we have something available for every type of client, which I think is kind of nice. And um, so it gives them an opportunity that, that there actually is no excuse. So from our own well professional brands to assistant professional and Sebastian and so on and so forth, I think it's very important that the client and the, the team have a strong knowledge and basis. So really I've divided them down to kind of specialists, which makes it kind of exciting. And um, so like Shane is one of our specialists for assistant professional. So if we have something for, you know, treating or very something very specific or something very complex going on, that we can call on him and say, right, look, he will know more about this. So it really gets the team involved. I think, again, it's very good for the morale of the team. Mm -hmm. We work, but for me, it's information, information, information. You have to feed your client. Um, they shouldn't be up in TK Maxx buying whatever. The lady behind the counter there can't tell them how to use it. So I do really rein it back in. And I suppose there's a little bit of territorialness in me where I, I kind of let the client know that I'm the boss and I know what I'm doing. And that's what they expect. They are expecting that, and they are. I, I do think they're disappointed if if you don't suggest everything that's best for them. We all know clients love smells and packaging and all that sort of thing. They like the fuss. So I think if you have a, a team member that has the fear of selling, get them on it straight away because clients are everybody's spending at the minute. People are. Yeah. They want the, the little luxuries. They're not. You know, if there's, there's, there's things they can't spend on. They're not going on holiday, so they prefer to have that nice shampoo and mask in their shower. Yeah, we were talking about this with Tash, actually, about making sure that your stylists aren't using the excuse of, well, you know, redundancy, people have got less money. There's a whole yeah. spectrum of how the, the, the economy at the moment is affecting. You're going to have those clients who are not who haven't paid childcare for three or four months, haven't been on the three holidays they'd normally have gone on, and they want those little luxuries. And, you know, we can offer that to them and encourage them to shop local. When we don't talk to them, we're giving them excuse to go online, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget a stat we had, which was about 75% of people buy from professional recommendation. If we don't yeah. make the recommendation, they're not going to buy. So um, yeah. but it sounds like you've got the role models in your team as well, including yourself that are doing it on a daily basis. Tash, I know in, in hop salons, you have your hair care experts, right? And just talk about how you're keeping retail at the front of mind every day with those guys. So I totally agree with everything that Sarah said. I think you're bang on, Sarah. I think, I'm not going to lie, and maybe there's other salon owners listening to this or salon managers, the retail word um, is very challenging in our business at the moment. I'll be honest with you. Um, we've invested time and education into retail ever since I've been part of the company. And obviously you don't get to build Rome in a day. And it does, that retail culture, you know, a culture does take time. It's not something that happens overnight. And it's kind of felt like a bit of a kick in the teeth because before lockdown, actually things were looking more positive and we just relaunched our hair care expert program. And then obviously lockdown happened. And similar to Sarah, we then had clients contact us to say, listen, can I buy X, Y, and Z from you? So that's really got us into the thought process of offering a service online to our clients where if for whatever reason they don't want to come in and they're still associated to the brand that they love and we can obviously organise getting their retail to them. Um, but one of the silver linings, and this is what we do say to all of our teams, to the hair care experts who are the people in each of the salons that are responsible for driving that area of the business. It was almost like a stepping stone that we created that role for people that wanted to be more than just a hairdresser and that wanted to get into management. So they would take that as the next step and they would start to manage the retail side of the business working alongside the management teams to teach them about stock and you know profit and loss and how to manage those sort of things and really motivate the team into you know recommending or advising because we know that hairdressers hate the word selling um but the silver lining that i do think that we do have is yes you can buy things online yes you can have your you know you can do your color yourself but you can't cut your hair yourself and you can't get a haircut online which means that we have a captive audience of clients walking through our doors every single week now i can't talk on behalf of the nation but i do know that if someone is looking after me and they're talking to me about what it is that i need i want to be walking out of the salon or a shop 
shop with that product in my hands. I don't want to have to wait for it to be delivered and then potentially for, for me to try it and, you know, and not do the job that I'm looking for. The other thing that we do offer is a money back guarantee. And what we say to our clients is, is we are so confident that these are the right products for you that actually, if you're not happy with it, then you can either get your money back, which is obviously, you know, part of the Nioxin um, ethos, yeah, and the guarantee. And we actually also do that on our other Weller lines as well, because we just feel that if there is that fear factor about spending that little bit more, we're trying to instill confidence into the client to say, actually, you know what, we know what we're talking about. We know this is going to be great for you. And if you're not happy, use it and bring it back. So we're still working on that. We've obviously got our what's meant to be the busiest quarter of the year, Christmas coming up. We've just got all of our box sets and everything that's arrived. We're really focusing on the added value, the gift with purchase and getting people excited about it. Like what Lars said, we just had our managers meeting and franchise meeting last week. And I think everyone walked in and was feeling a bit flat and a bit uncertain as to what we were going to be talking about. But it was super positive. I think everyone left with a real spring in their step. And like Lars said, it's about how we make people feel. We know that if we have got a motivated workforce, they're going to deliver for us. And if they are not feeling the way that they need to, then we're not going to get the results. Mm. So I would definitely say that if you have got someone in your salon or your salons that's a real standout person, use that person as best practice, recognize them, um, show them and advise them as to where the business is going and get ideas from your team as well, because a lot of what we create is actually very much um created from what our teams are saying they feel they need mm -hmm. and i think if you are creating initiatives that the team are on board with you're, you're sort of 75 percent of the way there because if they're yeah. not on board with it, it's never going to work and you're empowering them aren't they because they feel you know versus the big e-com giants out there they do feel a little bit non-empowered so it sounds like you're trying to empower them to say here are the things that you want and you know retail is still very relevant and it's a way of making you know that whole experience like Lars was talking about earlier a bit more personable yes they can go on and line and buy it but nobody's going to come to their house and look at their scalp environment look at the ends of their hair and actually tell them what's right so Lars can you talk about that a little bit you know because like we said people want to increase their revenue salon owners want to increase revenue they've got less clients how do you make as well as giving them the right retail products and the right recommendations how do you make a difference to service um, so they're paying and they feel it's worth coming into salon these days? Um, <clears throat> may I say something about the retail that we Please. just, just okay. talked before? Because yeah. what Tash just said makes me smile because in Germany it's it's 100% the same. Yeah, The hairdressers don't like the word selling. And <laughs> uh, when we have new empl uh, employees in our uh, business, the first day is with myself and I, I I tell them the culture of our of our company and all the tradition. And then there is a moment every time when I say, you know, one thing is very important. If you want to work in our salon, it's not allowed to sell products. I don't want that you sell products. And then every time they look at me like, oh, Yes, <laughs> the right salon. And then I and, and then mm -hmm. I, I, I tell them what what is important for us that you know when the when our guest is out of our salon, they don't we, we don't see them the next six or uh, six or, or eight weeks. And you have to think about what does this customer need for the next six or eight weeks? And you have to talk about that. This is the law in our salon. Don't sell products, just say what you think what would be good. And, and so uh, I think that our employees make a good job with this because they don't feel comfortable when we say, okay, now we have, a, I don't know, a battle for this or that uh, uh, product. They hate this. Yeah. And, and um, to answer your question, oh man, it's, um, it, it, as I said before, I think if I would be a, a guest in our salon and uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's more than in the past, more important that you feel like uh, uh, 
you're a very special person. You know, sometimes we need more time for the for the uh, uh, for the same haircut or for the same hair color, but we spend more time with the customers because high quality is our uh, is is our most important goal that we have. Yeah. I I know some hairdressers in Germany. They said to me, I, I don't know if I. Uh, lost all my creativity but after the restart the google uh, um uh, how do you say in english um um um, 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 um you know the the um the google rating yeah. the google rating goes yeah. down because right. more and more customers they don't feel comfortable anymore and they put it down and so we said in our salon the most important thing is our quality so with one of my team members, I made, uh, um, uh, we decided how can we, uh, um, uh, uh, how, how, how can we manage the education in our salon still? Mm -hmm. We have still education with a small group of our hairdressers because the, mo the, the, the most important focus is quality. Mm -hmm. And this is how we run, how we try to run the business. Okay, and it's kind of your, we say USP here, it's your unique selling point, right, for your salon, it is that experience and, and making sure that you're delivering on that. Um, Raymond, what are your um, thoughts on what you've just heard on the retail and experience front? Um, good question. <laughs> I've been sitting here, there's so much uh, everyone's been talking about, yeah. just keeping up with. <laughs> so the, I guess, um, touching on a few different things here, like we spoke about Online, we spoke about marketing, we're talking about product. Um, and I'd said previously that it's people, um, it's the stylist, they have the relationship with the client. Um, and again, the stylist has um, the relationship with the client, therefore they, they, they sell the product, but they need the right clientele to sell the product too. Um, and sort of thinking about marketing, Instagram being a popular way to inspire people to come into your salon. Um, I do think there's an aspect where some salons have thought that Instagram is marketing and it ends there. Now, for me, I'd be looking at my overall strategy to, for our salon, we're about color. You, you find anything about my salon, color, 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 color. In fact, my Instagram is just color um, because color clients will typically need to buy hair care and are spending a larger bill in your salon. So it's, it's easier to put retail onto that bill. If someone's just coming in for a wet cut for 20 quid and you try and sell them 30 pounds worth of product it's disproportionate mm -hmm. so color business for me is the thing that's encouraged great retail growth for our business um but it all started at actually looking at the overall strategy not just kind of at things that uh, like instagram putting up photos and hoping that that's going to bring in some business um you know what is our business doing how is it performing and what what do we need to do more of what makes more money and it's the overall strategy for me looking at the PL, looking at the key performance indicators and um as i said color salons are amongst the most profitable in industry so driving more color business and selling or recommending retail to those color clients yeah so definitely you mentioned it a couple of times there and it it's about profitability, isn't it? And we all recognise the value of, of a great colour client because we know that it's going to be so much easier for them to, or for us to create the value for them to take home those products, right, when they've just spent upwards of £100 on a colour. Yeah. Sarah, I saw you nodding away there. Any? Um, did you want to add something? No, I just really agree with Raymond. Like, we we are a colour shop and actually we do not take blow-dry clients anymore into the salon. Um, we've, we've, we've actually got rid of the service um, and it's because of how we're working. Um, I just listened to Tash when she was talking about that. Like, you know, it's it must be so difficult for me. It's like, get that colour into the chair. They We have to work our salon now on a time spec. But the one thing I do want to talk about actually is, you know, like when you're talking about services um, and the one thing that I can share is that to be able to let the salons kind of, um, I suppose, evolve the service into better price span, we actually do our services in, in timings so they're all timed very similar. So when a client walks in, let's say, and they're, and they're maybe booked for a half head of highlights, um, we've, we've marked them for an hour. So that if you decide to actually do a full balayage at double the price, that you can because the time is actually specifically there for it. And that's the one thing we've changed and it's working really, really well. So we're upping the service so that the financial end of things of the business 
is um, the figures are, are, are more at the end of the day. And it's just, it's a clever way for us, I suppose, to be working at the minute. Um, our clients have had no problem. Obviously, we blow dry their hair when they're finished, but we're not taking sole blow dries. You know, we're, we can't because it disrupts our day and um, because we can only have so many bodies in the salon at a time. But just for any salon, especially here, over here in Ireland, you know, there's a lot of small salons where they kind of are only six or seven seaters. They really need to be thinking about colour, you know, as more what needs to be in their chair rather than the other services. That's so interesting. I don't think I don't know if anybody else has heard that on the screen, but I've not heard that yet for, from a sound business. So that's really interesting. So uh, I'm guessing when somebody rings up and says, I'd like to book in for a blow dry on a Saturday, say, yeah, you can, but you're going to have to have a colour fresh or you're going to have to have yeah. this. On. Yeah. Yeah. And if they only want a blow dry, we just actually recommend them to another salon in the town. And wow. we actually say to them, yeah, we do. And we, we say to them, listen, we hope you'll, when you decide to have your colour done, we hope that you'll come back to us. And they do. They come back for colour. So it's, I just felt that, look, I'm nearly 30 years hairdressing. I don't want to be standing on the floor blow drying hair. I really don't. I love my creative work. And I thought that it was a perfect time for me to say, right, look, let's do this and let's try it. And um, another friend of mine within the industry did it a couple of years ago before any of this. And I just thought she was the bravest girl and it, wow. it really has worked for her. Yeah. So I just said, you know, if you, if you change that's not what you want to be and don't be that you know it's been it's been amazing it really has been amazing and that's your strategy and you're sticking to it and yeah good yeah. good for you Sarah good for you and we are running out of time which I knew we would so if we could just go around and just see because obviously Sarah's talked about that there you know her focus is color 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 for what we would call Q2 or the Christmas time, like Tash said, hopefully it's going to be, you know, our highest football time, which it usually is every year, please. Um, what would you, can we just go around and see what everyone's key focus is or key strategy for October, November, December? Can we start with you, Raymond? Like, what would you say, like, what's your focus and what would you encourage others to focus on if it's maybe just one thing over the next three months? Rebooking. Rebooking. Yeah, you want, there's no point in having a really busy golden period. You want business all through the year. Um, if you inspire a rebooking culture in your salon, it can be Christmas all year round, stylists hitting target consistently, the salon performing at all times. Um, rebooking is, um, that's my thing. And it always has been. In my salon manager, they call me Rebooking Raymond, the members, because it's all I bang on about. All my staff, I walk in and it's my rebooking tie, I swear, and they're like up against the wall. <laughs> So it's, you know, like you've got to rebook them clients and I'm going to be honest. I don't think December is going to be the golden thing. I think that, you know, people aren't going to be going to Christmas parties. There's not going to be potentially as much interaction around this season. And I think you can't bank on it. You've just got to be consistent. You've got to get your team performing now better than ever. Um, stop saying at the end of your appointment, are you all right for appointments and do you want to rebook? Talk about the colour journey, upsell your appointments in the consultation, communicate, um, you know, as, uh, I don't know, conscientious hairdressers, building sincere relationships. Like it's, that's what it's about. As Lars said, emotion, that's what you're dealing with. When people are sad, the stock market goes down. When people are happy, the stock market goes up. You know, it's, make them happy. Tell and them the plans. And any incentive, right? I agree with everything you're saying, anything, everything you're saying, but incentive, you do do any rebooking incentive in your salon or is it, yeah. no, that is our, that's our culture. We rebook the end. My rebooking culture is phenomenal in my business. I've just had someone join my salon and he, he gets it. Um, and he's at 80% rebooking and that includes new clients as well, which is astronomical. Typically I wouldn't, ex I mean, the industry rebooks at about 20 to 30% for new clients. He's at 80 mm -hmm. Um, because he knows I've just sort of <laughs> thrashed it into him that, that this is going to be what makes you successful. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you want a client, a column full of clients that retain, that rebook and they recommend. That's what you need. And you need sincere relationships. One of the things that we've noticed as a color salon is we've got what I call one hit wonders. Clients that just want to come and go, one visit, hated every other salon in town and they want you to be the, the wizard the, the, you know, that puts it all together and makes it right. It never works. A great relationship is what you're looking for. People that want to visit more than once and recommend all their friends and family and everybody else. Um, so rebook. Um, it will change your business for the better, I think. And, and say to your clientele, 
don't use the word all right because all right doesn't mean anything anymore it's like how do you feel i'm all right it actually means there's something completely wrong mm -hmm. so i need to see you in eight yeah. weeks to maintain this fabulous do that i've done Lars, thanks, Raymond. So Lars, for you, what are you focusing on for the next three months? And how do you think Christmas is going to be in Germany? Um, in I'm, I'm with Raymond. I don't think that we have a, a, a business, a Christmas business uh, as we had it in the past. Um, but I also think it, it wouldn't be a good sign for our customers if we have this business, uh, uh, um, a Christmas business as we had in the past. So um, I, I can only say, yeah, focus on the team, focus on the mood in, in your salon, focus on the, uh, uh, on the quality and uh, don't get panic. Just be, you know, just, just be a hairdresser as you want to be and, and uh, uh, have patience. Patience, yeah, 100%. Tash, for you, I know you, Lars just said about happy team. What, what, what's your big focus for the next three months? So, Raymond, I was smiling when you were obviously saying your thing because it's literally like what we eat, sleep and breathe and repeat and repeat and repeat the whole time. But everything that we do, our objective is all about the returning client. And that is what we use with every strategy that we implement, whether it's internal education and making sure that when our team come up for a course, that they are the best that they can be and making sure that they get that client back down to the service in the salon down to the coffee that we serve or that we were serving that we sadly can't at the moment, but down to absolutely everything. It's all about the returning client. And without that, we don't have a business. Um, you know, we are trying to accept that if someone used to read book and were coming in six, maybe six or eight weeks, they are stretching their appointments. Um, I think it is about being aware as to what's going on out there. Things like the curfews on restaurants, potentially pubs closing, um, it's getting darker outside with the winter weather is kind of, you know, approaching us. It does impact the way people feel and how they're, they're living, how they're spending their money. But you know what, I am actually remaining hopeful and I know that it might not be what we've done over previous years, but I think that the shit's going to hit the fan, excuse my French, come January, furlough comes to an end at the end of this month. And I think people are going to want to make the most of what they can get in this year, this side of Christmas, because I think come January, it could be um, quite a negative situation that we're in. And I want to try and focus on, you know, reaping all of the opportunities that we could have this side of the year. So yes, I agree with the guys and what they've said. I don't think it's gonna be like previous Christmases, but you know, when we reopened on July the 4th, it was like Christmas times a hundred for us. We've never been so busy and it was incredible. So where are all those clients going to be, you know, as we approach this time of year, we saw that influx coming again when, you know, parents were sending their children back to school at the beginning of September. I was one of them, celebrations. <laughs> um, and I think that again, you know, people like Sarah said, they're looking for those quick, inexpensive experiences because we're all not feeling particularly wonderful and you know what I will go in and have my hair done for you know 25 30 pounds it's interesting to hear what Sarah said as well about the fact that she doesn't do um blow dries anymore because we actually built hair on Broadway which is what we were called on the blow dry and actually we launched something a couple of years ago called the 20 pound on the day blow dry because our ethos is get your client in for a blow dry it leads to a cut and blow dry color retail wellaplex and all those things too so it's really interesting to hear as to how other people are doing things and really eye-opening and i think it's great sarah that you're you've, you've done that and you've made that decision for yourselves i think we're quite fortunate in terms of the space of our salons because we do have the chairs to be able to facilitate the blow dries and the colors and the cuts. Um, but I just wanna wish everyone a really positive and successful Christmas because I know we're coming to an end and I'm proud of the industry that we work in. I think we're doing amazing things and I think that we will come through this and we need to keep doing and keep sharing the ideas. And I think for those salons that are doing the things that they need to be doing, we, we're gonna survive. So I wish everyone the very, very best. Thank you for that positivity, Tash. Um, just one question that's come up on the chat, and we're just going to do it in 30 seconds. I'm going to start with Sarah, because I know everyone wants to still know this. 
Quick uh, yes or no answer. Sarah, did you put your prices up when you reopened? And that could be because of PPE or other reasons. And are they still up now? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Tash? Yes, we did. Yes, PPE. Lars? Yep. Raymond? Yes, PPE and cutting. There we go. Resounding yes from everybody. You know, guys, if we want to be on the high street in the next five weeks, five months, five years, we have to put our prices up and charge what you guys are worth, which is a lot, right? People's mental health, the way we look and feel is so important. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. It's been really great. It's been really real, but really positive as well. So I thank you for that because like all of you have said, it's a really tough time at the moment and people's anxiety are through the roof, especially business owners who have worked their guts out for many, many years. Um, so all power to you. And as well, we are here to support you and help you survive because we are in survival mode. There's no doubt about it. So um, I think we've got a few diamonds of the day. We just wanted to round up quickly um, to say what a few of our highlights that we've talked about today, but I hope everybody out there has enjoyed it. There have been a lot of questions coming through. It's been difficult to manage four people on a panel and look at the questions. So we will capture them all and we will put out an FAQ um, to all of you that have um, joined today. This is also being recorded so you can watch it back as well. And we'll signpost to you where we're gonna put it, whether it's on our IGTV or whether it's on our Weller Education platform. Um, a few of the diamonds of the day, so every client is gold dust. Absolutely, the most important thing is to remember to rebook. I mean, we say it all the time. Do we live it and breathe it every day? No, because we've got a million and one things to do. But I think especially if this is a higher footfall time, if we can relive a little bit more of Ju June, July time, then um, over the next three months, then let's get those clients rebooking. Number two is reviewing your business to maximize your marketing. Absolutely. And looking at all the different ways that you can maximize your marketing, you know, all the different social channels. Um, and number three, supporting your salon revenue with home care and retail. 75% of clients do buy from recommendation. So it's just making sure, here's my cat, he's just come to say hello. Hello, Simba, brilliant. Hope people like cats out there. <laughs> um, and the final one, thanks guys for laughing. Um, I can't read the bottom one, but I think it's engaged with the team and how do they feel? So keeping in touch with how your team and how you feel and how your clients feel and like Raymond said, all right, doesn't actually mean people are doing too great. So digging a bit deeper. Fabulous. I think that is everything. What we would love to do is for you guys just to answer our poll, just to see if we do do this again, how would you like us to improve? What have you enjoyed about today? What have you got out of today? Um, and if you do want us to do it again, please let us know. Um, and other than that, I think I'm going to let everyone go and either have a late lunch or just get on with their days. But um, best of luck to everybody. And um, I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of the afternoon. So thank you to all our panelists as well. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, later. Bye. Please fill out our poll. Thank you. Bye, Lars. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. We're going to have two amazing days together. Wow, it's been fantastic. It's a wonderful event at a wonderful venue. Yay.